1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58 is the verse that is key for this lesson this morning. In it, after he had been discussing for 57 verses the resurrection of Christ and our resurrection coming, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. If what we had been involved in was classroom instruction through all of these lessons, today would not be test day. We would forego that. Everyday life constitutes test day. What we'd be having this morning is a pep rally. That's where Paul takes all of it finally in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus has really risen from the dead. God promises based on that fact that we're going to rise from the dead. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Therefore, that means these words of encouragement are all based upon the facts that have been presented, the revelation that has been given. Let's walk back through where we've been. This all began the first Sunday of September with us thinking about that question that Paul asked in Acts chapter 26 and verse 8. Why should it be thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? If there is a God who created everything, and if there's not, why are we here? And why do we ever open the Bible? Because from page 1, that's what it's all about. If there is a God who is the creator and has the power that the Bible teaches us he has, why wouldn't he be able to raise the dead? And we thought about the answers that were given uh, to people who were challenging that thought as we read the New Testament narrative. From there, we went on to see instances of when God raised the dead. It happened in the Old Testament during the ministries of Elijah and Elisha. It happened in the New Testament, in the ministry of Jesus, and then that of his apostles. People have been raised from the dead before. But there's something different about their resurrection and the resurrection of Christ, which is the heart of the New Testament. And that is that those people all died again. And they wait to be raised as we do if we have died before Jesus comes back. But then in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of those Gospels leads to the point of Jesus' death and on the third day, His resurrection from the dead. And we studied Luke's account in particular one Sunday morning and tried to take in all that that writer presents to us. The resurrection is the heart of the New Testament message. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? There are hard and fast skeptics who say he did not, he could not. Well, we've already thought about the power of God to do so, to raise Jesus from the dead. And we've studied the accounts of the New Testament that say Jesus rose from the dead. Did it really happen? Well, we looked at a number of evidences for the resurrection of Christ one Sunday morning almost 2,000 years ago. His tomb was found empty. No one can point you to the tomb of Christ over in Jerusalem or outside Jerusalem and say, here are his bones. Here's what's left of him physically. No one could do that after the third day because his body was not there when people went to find it. After that, on that day and for 40 days thereafter, Jesus appeared to various people in various settings. He didn't appear as a ghost or anything like that. He appeared in a resurrected body and he gave them the the proof of the nail prints in his hands and his feet and that that place where a, a sword was thrust through his side. This was really Jesus and really in his body that had been dead, but he was alive. And as he said in Revelation chapter 1, Behold, I'm alive forevermore. There are many, many evidences of the resurrection of Christ. Many, many things changed after that time. Lives changed, for one thing. In a couple of lessons, we studied about this transformed trio in particular, Peter 
and James and Paul. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John present to us Peter, warts and all. He was not an infallible person. He was hard to deal with sometimes. And he was continually tripping himself over his own claims about himself. And it seemed that finally he had failed Jesus miserably on the night of his arrest, his betrayal, and his, his crucifixion. But Jesus wasn't done with Peter, and Peter's life was transformed in a way that can only be explained if he really knew that Jesus was risen from the dead and wasn't done with him. We thought about Paul, known formerly as Saul, who was doing everything he could to destroy belief in the name of Jesus in the first century. The church was newborn. Paul wished it could have been aborted. He went everywhere he could, persecuting Christians, uh, casting his vote for their death until Jesus confronted him. Jesus really was alive, and as Jesus found Paul on the road from Jerusalem to Damascus, he stopped him in his tracks, he blinded him. And in Damascus, he had a man named Ananias teach him the gospel. Paul listened until finally Ananias said, Acts 22, verse 16, And now what are you waiting for? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And that's just what Saul did. And from that moment, he began to teach and to preach that Jesus is the Christ. And to him, the main thing was the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Another guy we thought about was James. There are several James mentioned in the New Testament. This one grew up in the same household as Jesus, where Mary and Joseph were mother and father. And during the time of Jesus' three-and-a-half-year ministry, he, like his other brothers and sisters, didn't believe that Jesus was who he said he was. But soon after the resurrection, you find James a leader in the church of Christ. And he writes one of the New Testament letters that we appreciate very much. Their lives and the lives of many others are evidence that Jesus was really risen from the dead. Why did God raise Jesus from the dead? It was to vindicate Jesus in the first place. God had been saying through the Old Testament prophets that the Messiah will come, he'll suffer and die, he'll be buried and he'll rise from the dead. Well, if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, uh, that pulls the table out from underneath many, many prophets who came before Jesus, whose words are recorded in Scripture. But Jesus rose from the dead, and God's words are vindicated. Jesus had told people, I am the Christ, the, the Son of God. Really? Well, anybody can say that. He was declared to be the Son of God with power by His resurrection from the dead through the Spirit of holiness. Romans chapter 1, verse 4. He was vindicated. He really is who he says he is. His resurrection says so. So for his benefit, he was raised from the dead. But for our benefit especially, he was raised from the dead. Romans chapter 4, verse 25 says that he was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. We sing about the cross and we pray about the cross and we think about the cross and we reflect on the love of God expressed in that sacrifice. But it's a package deal with His resurrection. How can we know that Jesus really accomplished all that for us in the cross? It's because He rose from the dead, just like He said He was. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. There's power in the cross and in the resurrection of Christ. How do I get in touch with that power? That's where we studied from Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, and Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 was written to Christians. And it reminds us that we were buried with Him in baptism, in which we were also raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Him from the dead. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4 identifies us with both the death 
and the resurrection of Christ, and His burial in between when we're baptized into Christ. Resurrection is powerful. And the people who will benefit from the resurrection of Christ are the people who are in Christ. We're in Christ when we have been baptized into Christ, just the way Travis and Megan and Clint were last Sunday night. From there, we thought about how good it is that Jesus is alive. I'm a Christian, and I, that, that means I, I believe in Jesus. I have repented of my sin. I, I'm willing to confess my faith publicly. I've been baptized into Christ, raised with Him to walk in newness of life. I still don't have it all together. And you don't either. And we need help like the risen Christ can give. And so in that lesson, we focused especially on what the book of Hebrews says that Jesus is doing right now. He's reigning as our king. He's taking care of us as our high priest before God. There at the right hand of God, we find Him serving all the time to give us mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Hebrews chapter 13 calls Him the shepherd, the great shepherd who's still leading our lives. It's a good thing Jesus is alive. There's a resurrection lifestyle to be lived by everyone who's been raised with Christ in baptism. Colossians 2.12 said that we've been raised with Him in baptism. And Colossians 3 verse 1 says, If then you have been raised with Him, with Christ, seek the things that are above that are seated uh, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And all the rest of the way through that chapter, Paul shows us there are things that ought to be no more a part of our lives. And there are things that ought to be lots more part of our lives. Because Jesus has risen from the dead and because there's a promise waiting for us. At that point in our series, we transition to think about the promise. Jesus is risen from the dead. That's the basis of it all. And then God makes us the promise that we too will rise from the dead. Jesus liked to talk about that. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, for example. But then you find it time and time again, a few times in the Old Testament, but especially through the New Testament preaching in the book of Acts and through the letters that the apostles and prophets wrote. It all points ahead to the end of time when Jesus is coming back and he'll raise us from the dead. Well, why does that matter? Don't we die and go to heaven if we're faithful to God? We're still part of the story that needs to be told according to the New Testament. God raises His faithful from the dead because that's redemption. The redemption of our bodies, Romans chapter 8 says. We sold out to sin and our bodies have been tools of sin and our bodies have suffered because of sin. But God gives us the redemption of our bodies in Christ. He buys them back. And when we're raised from the dead, that's the experience of redemption. Further, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, Paul taught that resurrection is about our our total transformation. We go through this life, uh, no matter how fit we are, how healthy we are, We go through this life comparatively in bodies of humiliation. But Philippians 3, 20 and 21 says that our citizenship is in heaven. And from there we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the bodies of our humiliation to be like His glorious body. According to the power with which He's able to subject all things to Himself. And then resurrection is about victory. It's about God getting the victory and about us sharing in that victory. When Paul had had written in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about the resurrection of Christ, about our resurrection coming, and, and given us some explanation of what that's going to be like, he said in verse 57, Thanks be to God 
who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the end, sin does not win. Suffering does not win. Satan does not win. God wins. And in Christ, we're on the winning team. Resurrection is about victory. The evening after we had talked about that, we thought about how different resurrection is from everything else that's put out there as what's coming in the future. Some people will talk about reincarnation. Reincarnation is punishment. It's not victory. Reincarnation in those religions that teach it is what happens to you because you didn't get it right in the last life. You didn't do good enough. And so you keep on trying to do better and better and to get more and more detached from from what life is here until finally you can be absorbed into the essence of everything. You lose your individuality finally. That's very different from resurrection. We're raised ourselves, but new and glorious to live with our Lord in the glorious environment in which He lives. By teaching us about resurrection, the Bible teaches us then, who talk about this a whole lot more, that the end of it all is not to die and go to heaven. Now, is that going to happen if you're faithful to God? When you die, things are going to be good. The Bible assures us of that. Philippians chapter 1, Paul said, I'd I'd like to depart and be with Christ. That'd be far better to die as gain And he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8 that to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. So after we die, if we're faithful to the Lord, things are good for us. But the state in which we find ourselves is not the end of it all. And if it were, then all of those things that are the reason for his resurrection are, are, are left out. Where's the redemption? Where's the transformation? Where's the total victory that says God triumphed over Satan? and God triumphed in our lives. Nothing less than resurrection answers the need. From there we went on to study here from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and imagine a resurrection body. Just what it will be like to have a body. And we can't really visualize ourselves without bodies. We even identify ourselves that way. But what will it be like when this body has been transformed to be like the Lord Jesus Christ's glorious body? Paul tells a little bit about that in 1 Corinthians 15, enough to capture our imagination. The truth is, some people are going to be raised from the dead, but they're going to be on the wrong end of resurrection. Jesus assured in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, that everybody in one hour, at one time, is going to hear his voice and come out of the grave. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment, Now, we've been dwelling on and encouraging ourselves by that one side, that that way that we want things to be for us when life is over. But if it's not going to be that way, then we're still going to rise from the dead. But we'll have some kind of body fit for hell that can experience torment forever. You don't go out of existence, but you're outfitted to suffer forever without any relief. We don't want that to happen. And so we follow Jesus and we follow him all the way. Last Sunday morning, we studied from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 about the hopeful hurt, the kind of grief that Christians have when another Christian dies. We still grieve. But Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, We don't want you to be uninformed. We don't want you to be ignorant so that you won't grieve like people who have no hope. We believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and we believe that he'll bring with him those who have risen from, or those uh, who have died in Christ. They'll be raised from the dead, and whoever is alive and faithful in Christ will be caught up together with him to meet the Lord in the air, and so will always be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 says, Comfort one another 
with these words. Those are the kinds of things that should be in our minds when we get back to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, and read, Therefore, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, be immovable. If Jesus is risen from the dead and we're going to be raised from the dead, we ought to be steadfast and immovable. In just a few weeks... While we're studying that series on the church, we're going to think in our discussion time why people quit. Why people quit on Christ. Why people quit on the church. It's not because they're thinking about Jesus' resurrection and their resurrection. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding, Paul says. Because Jesus has risen from the dead, because He's going to raise us from the dead, we can find God's strength for us to repent and to keep on repenting as much as we need to repent. We find power to overcome. We find reason to keep going. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. In the work of the Lord. What do you do because of Jesus? Because of His resurrection, because your resurrection that's coming, you ought to be always abounding in it. Do it with more focus. Do it with more enthusiasm. Do more of it. Do it better. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. When we think about the work of the Lord, we think about what we do uniquely because we're the church. We think about reaching people for the Lord, about evangelism. Jesus has risen from the dead. People are going to be raised from the dead. That ought to motivate us to abound in evangelism, in worship. Whenever we come together to worship, it ought to motivate us to give our very best to God because of what's already been accomplished in Jesus and and what's coming. In our learning, we ought to want to know more and more about Jesus and about what He holds in store for us. We ought to be abounding in our service to the Lord. We serve the Lord by serving other people, and so many do it so well around here. We'll do it better and better, and more with more perseverance, the more we think about Jesus risen from the dead and what's coming for us. Persevere, grow, overcome. When we think about resurrection, it helps us to press on when people are mistreating us. It helps us to not give up whenever we are suffering. It helps us to withstand temptation. It helps us in our addictions, and in our depression, in our grief, in all the things that would tempt to turn us away from Jesus. We abound when we think about resurrection. Paul says finally that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Even our biggest and worst defeat is reversed in resurrection. You and I keep seeing people right and left, it appears, losing to death. We haven't seen anybody get old and then overcome and not die when it looked like that's where they're headed, just like everybody else. But in resurrection, even our greatest enemy and our worst defeat is reversed. All of this encouragement is based on resurrection. You think about it. How really, truly inspirational are thoughts like these without resurrection, or in comparison to God's promise of resurrection? Hang in there. You hear that a lot? You say that a lot? Hang in there. Okay. Well, why? Why? If we're not going to be raised from the dead, why fight it? Don't lose heart. Well, why not? When things are really, really, really hard, why not lose heart? Don't give up. Well, why not? You think about all of the the inspirational quotes you hear and all the, the memes that say something just the way you think you needed to hear it. 
if it doesn't all lead toward resurrection from the dead and, and total victory, why not quit? Why not give up somewhere along the way? Paul says we have the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. He wanted more and more to know the power of resurrection. That's what he said in Philippians 3, verses 10 and 11. He wanted to know Christ and the power of His resurrection. He wanted to be conformed to the suffering of Jesus. Whatever he ought to learn from what Jesus suffered. He wants to replicate in his life. But he wants to know the power of resurrection. And by any means possible to attain to the resurrection of the dead. What about you? Let's read one last time from Ephesians chapter 1. A prayer that Paul prayed for those first century Christians that he'd pray for us, that we ought to be praying for ourselves. It has to do with the power of the resurrection in our lives. Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 15. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints... I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Pause right there. I'm praying that you'll have the eyes of your heart enlightened. Here's what I want you to get hold of more than anything else. Paul's praying, picking up, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? What is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that's named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And there's our bridge to where we're going next week and in the new year. We're the resurrection people, the church. God has great power that He wants to exercise in our lives. He wants to do the most wonderful things in us, in the church, by that power with which He raised Jesus from the dead. Let's be steadfast. Let's be immovable. Let's be always abounding in the work of the Lord. We know our labor is not in vain in the Lord. That last verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a real answer to the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon, time after time in that book toward the end of his life, would look at life and say, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. He tried this and he tried that and he tried it all and he couldn't find the answer until finally he concluded, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. We'll answer to God, he says. But it becomes positive and it becomes victorious when we think about Jesus and resurrection. This is the answer, verse 58, to what Paul had, had said in verse 19 in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If there's no resurrection, if Jesus is not risen from the dead, if we won't be raised from the dead, then, then what? Well, let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. But that's not how it is. Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Are you in the Lord? Many of you as were baptized into Christ, into Christ, have put on Christ. Is your faith in Christ? 
Have you turned away from sin to serve Christ? Are you willing to confess Christ? You could be baptized into Christ, into the Lord this morning. And you can live a life knowing it's not in vain. Everything I do because I love Him, because He tells me to, matters. It's always going to matter. If you're a Christian who's become discouraged, it's caused you to lag in your service to the Lord, why not tell us this morning, admit that, and and let us pray with you and encourage you. We have so much reason to be encouraged in Christ. If you need that encouragement this morning, we're singing this song first to encourage you and asking you to come. Let us know your need while we stand and sing together.